Hey there everyone, today we're going to be looking at chapter 6 through 8 of Franz Fanon's Black Skin White Masks. And in this concluding part of the book, Fanon is concerned with tying in some psychoanalytic considerations to understand why it is that these stereotypes of the black man exist and how this is internalized and creates some of the conflicts he's been talking about regarding black identity. Now, Fanon states that every society naturally requires its own specific form of catharsis. And in order to explain what this catharsis would be and how racial stereotypes and racism can play into this, he mentions Tarzan stories and, and a bunch of other media stories. And he says that they are written by white men for white children. And this is the crux of the matter. In the Antilles, and there's no reason to believe the situation is any different in the other colonies, these same magazines are devoured by the local youth, and the wolf, the devil, the wicked genie, evil, and the savage are always represented by blacks or Indians. And since one always identifies with the good guys, the little black child, just like the little white child, becomes an explorer, an adventurer, a missionary, who is in danger of being eaten by the wicked Negroes. And of course, before going on, I have to mention, like I did in the last video, I use certain choice language solely because it's in the text, not because I revel in it or because it's part of my common parlance. I just feel that this is very necessary for people to understand and to have you know, a certain amount of flow. So hopefully you'll forgive if it um, offends. That's not my intention. But we can see here the profound sort of collective building up of racial stereotypes that happens as this reminds me of like a Muhammad Ali interview where he's talking to his um, interviewer and he recounts a time when he was talking to his mom and he's like, why is it the devil's food cake is black? And, you know, then you've got the nice white angel, for example, and talking about all these, how, how the black color is associated with all these evil things. And as Fanon mentions here, the black child, just like the white child, will start to accede to certain stereotypes, identify with certain stereotypes that were built by white people, you know, who are running media organizations, for example. He continues here on page 126. In the Antilles, the black schoolboy, who is constantly asked to recite Our Ancestors the Gauls, identifies himself with the explorer, the civilizing colonizer, the white man, who brings truth to the savages, a lily-white truth. The identification process means that the black child subjectively adopts a white man's attitude. He invests the hero who is white with all his aggressiveness, which at this age closely resembles self-sacrifice, a self-sacrifice loaded with sadism. An eight-year-old child who is giving something, even to an adult, cannot tolerate a refusal. Gradually, an attitude, a way of thinking and seeing that is basically white, forms and crystallizes in the young Antillian. Whenever he reads stories of savages in his white school book, he always thinks of the Senegalese. As a schoolboy, I spent hours discussing the supposed customs of the Senegalese savages. In our discussions, there was a lack of awareness that was paradoxical, to say the least. The fact is that the Antillian does not see himself as Negro. He sees himself as Antillian. The Negro lives in Africa. Subjectively and intellectually, the Antillian behaves like a white man, but in fact he is a black man. He'll realize that once he gets to Europe, and when he hears Europeans mention Negroes, he'll know they're talking about him as well as the Senegalese. So, right, this racial category of the Negro, for example, is crafted by white people, by you know, by their perceptions of black people, which is, you know, often completely baseless, just based on um, internal fears or whatever. But this sort of 
ideal whiteness of civilizement, for example, and, you know, being advanced and fancy, the black child starts to associate with this and kind of masochistically starts to almost hate his own skin. And the black child won't really become conscious of their skin as an object of concern until they get in a situation where I mean, maybe it's a child who experiences racism for the first time. And, I mean, you realize that you've grown up in an environment in which all of a sudden everything you had been learned about is called into question, and you realize that maybe there are stereotypes that you've just been socialized into. So one of Fanon's points here is that Antillians, and this is kind of, you know, all these island chains in the Caribbean is the Antilles, they grow up in French school, but they're alienated when they realize that Frenchness has been grafted onto them, that the French don't necessarily see them as fully French, even though they see themselves as fully French. So there's this dichotomy, this split that happens where the individual black person has to choose between society, which is white, or their family, which is black. And there's this sort of latent myth of blackness that kind of rests in society until it's activated or volleyed. And you know, some traumatic experience like encountering racism will activate a feeling of alterity that retroactively builds on a blackness never actually articulated in the child's life. The child, you know, isn't a cannibal, isn't a savage, isn't whatever, but this just kind of appears from the mist and is grafted onto this black child. And I think this is kind of a funny point that Fanon talks about is how the image of black men was always framed as if they had some sort of secret, and particularly a sexual secret, that they had sort of some sort of sexual virility that black or that white men didn't have, and that oh the black men are coming to to rape our wives or whatever, or to steal our wives or to seduce our wives. And of course, the seductive aspect is sort of less offensive, you know, Um, it's sort of more integrated, but because of that, it's all the more of a scapegoat. And I think it's kind of funny that there's this sort of phallic power that's attached to black men, which is sort of a stereotype that like Fanon mentions in here that the average member of the black man's body isn't like significantly different from the white man's it's just sort of a an internalized feeling of inferiority within the white man that projects onto the black man this profound sexual power he writes on page 147 the white man is convinced the black man is an animal If it is not the length of his penis, it's his sexual power that impresses the white man. Confronted with this alterity, the white man needs to defend himself, i.e. to characterize the other who will become the mainstay of his preoccupations and his desires. That's right. There's there's almost like a hidden desire in here, a sort of racial jealousy where some sexual insecurities get grafted on to some other group that bears the load, that bears the the fantastical element of this in the sense of it being a fantasy. And as such, Fanon kind of paints racism as a sort of sexual frustration. And in terms of the psychoanalytic theory, he looks at Jung, for example. Carl Jung is, you know, very popular in terms of thinking about, like, social hysteria, for example. And Jung has this idea of the collective unconscious, which is some sort of collection of instinctual psychic prejudices that are kind of the mass buildup of the various psyches that constitute that society. And the problem is that the way Jung postulates the collective unconscious, it's almost something 
pre-social, it's something innate. And Fanon says Jung confuses instinct and habit. According to him, the collective unconscious is part of the psyche. The myths and archetypes are permanent engrams of the species. We hope we have shown that this collective unconscious is nothing of the sort and that, in fact, it is cultural, i.e. it is acquired. And this is part of Fanon's mission here to get rid of some innate blackness or innate whiteness, some innate racial capacities that judge how one ought to act socially. Because part of the problem that Fanon is facing is a sort of black guilt that gets associated with one's identity of trying to prove oneself as more intelligent than the stereotypes which obviously are set against the black individual to harm their ability to integrate into society and just like be a human being who can exist without prejudice. And Fanon sees this as kind of getting people of color in a bind unless they get rid of this fundamental assumption of, for example, the negritude movement, of this notion that there's some ancestral blackness that one needs to return to that will define one as, in fact, having a black identity that has stood the test of time. But, of course, part of the problem is that, you know, the notion of black versus white, this is just a uncanny binarism, right? I mean, the notion of whiteness is often very restricted to Western Europeans, whereas blackness can cover anything from Hispanics to Arabs to Africans. You know, it, it can cover so much that, in fact, there really isn't a unifying factor here because there is no the black person, just like there is no the oriental. So just like in Edward Said's work, where he's looking at the notion of the orient and kind of picking this apart and realizing that there is no the orient, you know, the, the very notion of orientals is baked with this kind of all these contradictions about what it means to exist as part of that category. So for Fanon, he wants to get out of this notion of some innate identity that makes one the oppositional other to the white man. Instead, he wants to focus on a sort of bare existence that goes beyond um, psychoanalysis and just hits one as reality. He quotes Amy Césaire, who says, Beware of crossing your arms in the sterile attitude of the spectator, because life is not a spectacle, because a sea of sorrows is not a proscenium, because a man who screams is not a dancing bear. Which is like, you know, it's almost like a sort of anti-philosophical attitude of like, you can think all you want, but ultimately people are struggling. And you can get tied in these semantic games, but ultimately what matters is how it's affecting people trying to live their lives. So Fanon is trying to uncover this sort of collective hysteria of racism, and particularly European racism, in order to understand it as something socially created, something habituated, rather than something innate. Fanon continues on page 166, Deep down in the European unconscious has been hollowed out an excessively black pit where the most immoral instincts and unmentionable desires slumber. And since every man aspires to whiteness and light, the European has attempted to repudiate this primitive personality, which does its best to defend itself. When European civilization came into contact with the black world, with these savages, everyone was in agreement that these black people were the essence of evil. So, right, not only is this sort of social contagion of racism not only is it concerning just the other, but specifically, it's about the moral other. And deforming these objects of repressed desire on the part of the white individual and displacing those onto the person of color in order to 
have an object to lambast, really. There's sort of a secret sadism in here, whereby one can take all the stuff that one is ashamed of and put it onto someone else, you know, and insist, oh, we're civilized, we're not savages, we're not violent, we're rational, which really is just a denial of a rash of an irrationality that one won't admit is present in everyone. Fanon says, the collective unconscious is not governed by cerebral heredity. It is the consequence of what I shall call an impulsive cultural imposition. It is not surprising, then, that when an Antillian is subjected to waking dream therapy, he relives the same fantasies as the European. The fact is that the Antillian has the same collective unconscious as the European. So, right, this collective unconscious, which is something habituated and socialized, is shared by people across racial lines. But this collective unconscious is primarily enacted and created by white people. So, of course, there's this fundamental conflict between the fundamental unconscious that determines how any person acts in a society and the color of one's skin, which can either be, you know, in sync with that or it can be contrary to that. So a social milieu codes prejudices which get grafted onto the black person and then this causes various conflicts. So there's this personality and sense of self on one side and then the fact of one's skin color on the other side. And Fanon is really interesting, and, you know, sometimes I find him a little bit problematic because someone who is sympathetic to, like, the I don't see race, for example, sometimes Fanon sounds like he's saying that. And ultimately, I don't think he is. He's very well of, as he's talked about in, I think it was chapter four, on I covered it in my last lecture, about like the conditions in Africa surrounding apartheid, like the very real material and social conditions that create one from the outside. He's very aware of that, but he's trying to get rid of this absolute notion of color. And as such, he tries to show how these racial distinctions, they ultimately don't matter for him insofar as he gets along with French people, just fine. It's not like he has some fundamental ressentiment, for example. He writes on page 178, The black problem is not just about blacks living among whites, but about the black man exploited, enslaved, and despised by a, col a colonialist and capitalist society that happens to be white. You ask yourself, Monsieur Salamon, what would you do if there were 800,000 black people in France? Because for you, there is a problem. The problem of the rising black tie. The problem of the black peril. The Martinican is a French citizen. He wants to remain within the French Union. He asks only one thing, this Martinican. That the imbeciles and the exploiters let him live like a human being. I can see myself happily lost, submerged by the white flood composed of men like Sartre and Aragon. I should like nothing better. Monsieur Salomon, you say we gain nothing from being prudish, and we totally agree. But I don't get the feeling I have given up my personality by, marring, by marrying some European woman. I can assure you, I am not making a fool's bargain. So, right, this idea of a black problem, which feels very similar to, like, the Great Replacement Theory that's so rampant today that... There's this massive influx of immigrants that's trying to get rid of white people. This kind of existence in the zeitgeist of, you know, a black problem, quote unquote, is entirely circumstantial for Fanon. He says that this is a colonialist and capitalist society that happens to be white. So there's nothing inherent about this racialization that is inherently white. And there's nothing inherent in black and white people that prevents their mixing or their interactions with one another. 
He keeps his personality through these changes that racist people will say, oh, it's a fool's bargain, it's getting rid of your racial identity. Fanon's like, no. He says, what's all this about black people and a black nationality? I am French. I'm interested in French culture, French civilization, and the French. We refuse to be treated as outsiders. We are well and truly part of French history and its drama. So Fanon's saying, look, if you want to educate me and socialize me in Martinique as a Frenchman and then treat me like I'm not, he's like, you're just wrong. You're making up this blackness, quote unquote, that doesn't exist. He hasn't been socialized to feel allegiance to these ancestors that Europeans say he should be accountable to. Instead, he says, no, I am my own man. In chapter 7, The Black Man and Recognition, he talks about some Hegelian points regarding the importance of a two-way recognition that you know, requires a genuine struggle to find one's identity. And there's a problem for Fanon in assuming this naive, like, oh, I finally found my blackness. Fanon thinks that this is a little problematic because this is, of course, a bestowed category filled with all sorts of stereotypes that, okay, maybe now you're not enslaved like you used to be, but you're still enslaved in a different way to all sorts of subtle things that go under the radar. He writes on page 199, Man is human only to the extent to which he tries to impose himself on another man in order to be recognized by him. As long as he has not been effectively recognized by the other, it is this other who remains the focus of his actions. His human worth and reality depend on this other and on his recognition by the other. It is in this other that the meaning of his life is condensed. And this is a basic Hegelian point of the importance of the dialectic of recognition in terms of having an objective existence for self-consciousness. And he says, I ask that I be taken into consideration on the basis of my desire. I am not only here now locked in thinghood. I desire somewhere else and something else. I demand that an account be taken of my contradictory activity insofar as I pursue something other than life, insofar as I am fighting for the birth of a human world. In other words, a world of reciprocal recognitions. So, right, there's this fundamental struggle for reciprocity, for recognition in every single person, and he merely asks that it be taken into account that, in fact, the black man is struggling. The black person is struggling. As he says, the black man is a slave who is allowed to assume a master's attitude. The white man is a master who allowed his slaves to eat on his table. So, right, there's this sort of condescension that we see here of, oh, well, sure, de jure, slavery is gone in its most overt forms, but that doesn't mean slavery is actually gone or some of the stuff behind what made slavery what slavery was. In chapter 8, by way of conclusion, he opens with this quote from Marx from the 18th Brumaire, and the last sentence reads, before the expression exceeded the content. Now the content exceeds the expression. So this is, of course, in the context of Marx talking about a social revolution being drawn not from the past, but from the activity of the here and now that opens up into a future an active present that is able to open up, that is able to exceed the expression of what has came from the past. And as such, he writes that intellectual alienation is a creation of bourgeois society. And for me, bourgeois society is any society that becomes ossified in a predetermined mold, stifling any development, progress, or discovery. For me, bourgeois society is a closed society where it's not good to be alive, where the air is rotten and ideas and people are putrefying. And I believe that a man who takes a stand against this living death is in a way a revolutionary. And this living death is epitomized by static racial categories which occur through 
socialization, through this building up of the collective unconscious. And he says, I am a man and I have to rework the world's past from the very beginning. I am not just responsible for the slave revolt in Saint-Domingue. In no way do I have to dedicate myself to reviving a black civilization unjustly ignored. I will not make myself the man of any past. I do not want to sing the past to the detriment of my present and future. And this is again one of his fundamental disagreements with the Negritude movement, is for him this movement is concerned with trying to establish a black identity but, of course, Fanon rejects the unified nature of this black identity. This is why he's also not in favor of Pan-Africanism. Because, you know, Africa is so diverse. There's so many different cultures and peoples and ways of living. So for him, this notion of finding, you know, the black soul, he thinks is a bit of a bourgeois project which is ultimately going to conclude in an ossified state of living death that he doesn't want. He wants to construct identity, not retrospect an identity. He says, It is not the black world that governs my behavior. My black skin is not a repository for specific values. The starry sky that left Kant in awe has long revealed its secrets to us and moral law has doubts about itself. As a man, I undertake to risk annihilation so that two or three truths can cast their essential light on the world. So, Fanon fundamentally rejects this idea that there's something special about his black skin that prefigures the kind of future that he's allowed to make. Instead, he wants to Yes, acknowledge the material conditions that are placing one in a suppressed position, in an oppressed position. But in terms of building an identity, he wants to get rid of returning to the black soul, for example. And he wants to create the black soul in a way that's not any different from just creating a human soul. He writes, it is not my duty to be this or that. If the white man challenges my humanity, I will show him by weighing down on his life with all my weight of a man that I am not this grinning Iabon Bananiya figure that he persists in imagining I am. I find myself one day in the world and I acknowledge one right for myself, the right to de demand human behavior from the other, and one duty, the duty never to let my decisions renounce my freedom. There is no white world, there is no white ethic, any more than there is a white intelligence. There are, from one end of the world to the other, men who are searching. I am not a prisoner of history, I must not look for the meaning of my destiny in that direction. I must constantly remind myself that the real leap consists of introducing invention into life. In the world I am heading for, I am endlessly creating myself. So, right, he wants to come up with identity that is grounded in action here and now, in showing that, you know, I'm not what you said I was, I'm not the stereotypes that you see in the media, I am a person in my own right. And I think that's really interesting for understanding this work's profound impact on um, African studies, on post-colonial studies, in terms of focusing on just conveying experiences of alterity and difference that go beyond these fixated categories. He says, there should be no attempt to fixate man, since it is his destiny to be unleashed. I am my own foundation, and it is by going beyond the historical and instrumental given that I initiate my circle of freedom. The misfortune of the man of color is having been enslaved. At the end of this book, we would like the reader to feel with us the open dimension of every consciousness. My final prayer, O oh my body, always make me a man who questions. And that is exactly what this work is about. It is about questioning not only the imposition of the white mask on the black skin,
but on the difference between the skin and the mask. There's always masks. There's always this collective unconscious which is breeding in certain stereotypes. But what beats this collective unconscious, which is fundamentally a fantasy of displaced desires and insecurities, Fanon promotes a sort of realism that goes beyond psychoanalysis and asks us to act. So I hope this has been beneficial in terms of understanding this work. Check out my other lecture I've done on this if you have any questions. Check out any of my other stuff I've done on postmodernism, German idealism, other literature, gender studies. Become a channel member for $5 a month and gain access to, among other things, a monthly private philosophy Zoom that you can tailor to your needs. That's it, and I'll see you in another lecture.